that day you talked to us about a, a rather difficult period of life. For sure. And it uh, is a very, among the videos that I've hosted, a very watched video. And it was about that time that FDA showed up and shuttered your business. Yep. Good times. Yep, it was difficult, but you know, every, every what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? And so, yeah. so um, go ahead and if you don't mind, let's start there for just the nickel tour for those who missed that talk and I will share a link uh, so people can find it afterward. That's not what we're here to talk about today. We're going to talk about your new venture uh, and investing for social impact in medical devices. So Brian Meskin, Meshkin, ladies and gentlemen, take it away, Brian. Sure. Um, so uh, Joe, you want to just give like a little bit of a background on that or? A little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. A little bit different venue <laughs> than in the past. Like Joe, I missed the, the interpersonal contact uh, as well, but I'm grateful for technology uh, like this uh, that allows us during this crazy period over the past year and a half to be able to actually see people we care about and communicate at least face-to-face, -face, even though it's two-dimensionally through a screen. So uh, I'm grateful to all those companies who, uh, who uh, give us the opportunity to be able to at least communicate this way as we've been under lockdown for such a long period of time. Uh, my name is Brian Meshkin. Um, I'm a social entrepreneur and a social uh, impact investor. Uh, last time I had the privilege to join Joe at a meeting, I talked a little bit about a uh, previous company that I was the founder and CEO of uh, that was doing you know, some very social impact minded things. Still to this day, I'm still proud to say uh, that we have uh, the only technology in the peer reviewed literature uh, that is able to accurately predict patients who will be at risk for opioid abuse. Uh, we've heard over the past decade the, the tremendous uh, toil that the opioid epidemic has had, not only in this country, but in Canada and in other countries around the globe. And uh, we had developed a technology that involves some advanced algorithms combining both genetic testing and non-genetic factors uh, that would be evaluated to be able to predict patients with 96.7% accuracy uh, who would misuse opioids. And obviously a clinician who's looking to prescribe opioids post-surgery or in a chronic pain situation, to be able to know that information is really important. You can't just look at a patient and make a judgment call based on that. You can't just give them a questionnaire and hope they're gonna be honest um, and then prescribe something that could be very, very deadly. Um, Question for you. If they were, if they were going to be in a situation where they needed a painkiller of that magnitude, and your tests were to say, danger, what is an alternative treatment? A great Maybe. question. Obviously, that was up to the doctors to decide, but the, the choices that clinicians had were they could give injections. Um, uh, anesthesiologists will do different types of injections to be able to... Uh, ameliorate some of the pain. Uh, it may be something that if it's in a post-operative situation, they may only give for a few days rather than a 30-day prescription, which is the typical thing. You know, in, in, in the government's infinite wisdom where they create these rating systems, one of the things that was a perverse incentive around the HCAPS ratings and the STAR ratings was kind of around pain management. And so many surgeons uh, prior to the introduction of our technology at the time uh, would just prescribe people a bunch of opioids, hoping that they would be able to pacify their pain and thus get a better rating with the government and their feedback from the patients because they were able to do that. And so it, it led to a superfluous amount of uh, pills being prescribed. And it's not just the pills to the patient who it was being given, but it was also the fact that many of those pills people didn't want to take for a prolonged period of time. So they would sit on the medicine cabinet shelf at home. And as they say, idle hands are the workshop of the devil. Well, idle opioid pills sitting in someone's medicine cabinet that aren't being used or disposed of properly um, are also a place where it can be a devil's workshop because those can end up in the hands of a teenager or others. Uh, and so there was a lot of pills in circulation. Um, and so you looking at injections, looking at other types of procedures, there are medical devices uh, that can be used uh, to help with uh, pain as well. Um, and then there are non-opioid pain medications medications, whether those are anti-inflammatory, anti-epileptic, uh, there are a series of other things that can be prescribed uh, to avoid that. And that was just one of the profiles that we had. We actually had 28 different uh, algorithmic profiles um, that would then answer some of those questions. So if you have to prescribe something else, what is someone more likely to respond to based upon the, the usually the cocktail of other medications mm -hmm. uh, that they're taking? Because many chronic pain patients have other comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera. And so you can't just look myopically at one particular area, you need to take into consideration uh, all the other medications that they're taking. I recall that part of um, the company downfall was, I can say, maybe you wouldn't use these words, um, deliberate sabotage. 
Oh, for sure. Yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. And, and disgruntled uh, we, people. Yeah, we had all the emails <laughs> to track all of it. I was shocked. Um, but yeah, there, there was, I, I guess, one of our attorneys called it corporate terrorism. Um, Are you broke uh, yeah. out there? Corporate what? Corporate terrorism is what the attorney referred to it as. I had never heard the terminology before. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, now it's it's amazing what people will say. And so, um, you know, facts are facts and evidence is evidence. Um, but uh, but you, you can definitely twist some truths and, and make some bold faced lies and say some pretty damaging things about companies or people. So I think we see we've seen that. I think some of the craziness even that we saw just during this pandemic. Uh, if you remember at the very beginning, people were hoarding toilet paper and all that type of stuff. Um, I think it's because we've gotten to a point where people don't trust the institutions that they used to trust. They don't trust the government the way they used to. They don't trust law enforcement the way they used to. They don't trust the media the way they used to. And so when all of this crap started hitting the fan, you know, in March of last year, um, people were hoarding toilet paper for what's primarily a respiratory illness. Um, and I think that was just indicative of the fact that people just didn't know who to trust and they were scared. And um, I think, unfortunately, as I mentioned in that talk, you know, with the dictionary having chosen post-truth, fake news, and misinformation as words of the year in the English language in 2016, 2017, and 2018, um, that's reflective of what we're seeing in our culture now. And uh, it's, a, it's a shame, um, but I think there's a general lack of trust. There's a lot of doubt, suspicion, um, just because people have misrepresented things so badly. You're here to talk about social impact, I imagine that environment makes your devotion precarious yeah no i mean it's it's you know if you were if you remember joe you know when we got to know each other a few years ago um i've had this pollyanna notion uh that someone like me who wasn't particularly special in any way you know i didn't grow up in a wealthy family i didn't have some kind of famous last name in fact i kind of had a weird last name um that um that i could make a positive impact in the world and after after my friend chris kelly was hit by a car and killed when i was 13 um in front of my home i initiated an effort by uh, lobbying for and enacting the very first bicycle helmet law in the united states and then helped create a nonprofit that back then was called the National Safe Kids Campaign. Today it's called Safe Kids Worldwide, uh, where we helped enact over 300 similar laws all across the United States. And um, so for me, kind of my journey in this all started with a device, but it was a bicycle helmet. And it started- May I, ask, may I assume that had Chris been wearing a helmet, you believe his life would have been saved? We, we believe so. I mean, it's all speculation, obviously. Uh, you don't know for certain, but um, we really, really felt that way. And um, I always remember, I mean, there's certain, scenes yeah. that are just singed in your yeah. mind you know whether it was um kneeling beside chris uh, on the side of the road or um or holding his mom's hand when the when the boat was taken they're just um they're just certain things that just strike you to the core um that forever changed my life and how i looked at things but um i'm a big believer that um that we can still do some good in the world despite all the forces that are out there, whether they are forces in industry, forces in the media, forces in government um, that have a vested interest in the status quo and the power and the money that's made in the status quo, that we can still we can still make a positive impact in the world, but it's hard. It's hard. You'll have people come after you for sure. Um, but I find so I find social impact investing really fascinating because kind of the contrast is um, we've all heard those that have been involved in raising capital of smart investors. Uh, the idea that someone is not just writing a check, but because of maybe their personal expertise, their professional acumen, their experience in industry, they can bring some intelligence about the market, about the product, about the technology, about the regulatory pathway, whatever it is. So they bring more because they're a smart investor. Um, but but with social impact investing, it's not necessarily about what you know in your mind. It's about what you know in your heart. Um, and so I refer to it as a heart investor. It's someone who is investing more than their money, more than just what they know in their mind, but they're investing their passion. Uh, it's something they really care about. And it's not like this is something new. Um, angel investors for a long period of time, individual high net worth individuals have invested in things that they care about. Family offices are notorious for investing into companies or technologies where maybe their family has been affected by a disease in a, some type of way, or they lost a child to something awful and it inspires them to want to help. 
Um, and But we're seeing now a real increase in even venture funds that are having a social impact. Um, I saw a study recently that 72% of millennials feel that their purchases or their economic or financial behavior can influence some of these social issues. Um, and so social impact investing is something that I, I've just this kind of done like a social entrepreneur for a period of time since I was a kid even um, because it just was important to me. Um, but now it's becoming something that's a, a little bit more uh, of interest to people. And so um, uh, I'm grateful to be a part of it. And I think we as social impact investors fill an important gap in the overall financing of medical devices and other healthcare technologies. Tell us about the structure of your new organization. How many people sure. are you? What do you call yourselves? Yeah, great. There's actually several organizations that I'm a part of. So with Profound Ventures, um, which is the social impact investment group that I started um, after my last company, um, that was with my chief legal officer uh, from that company um, who had done you know, 75 IPOs. She uh, raised you know, billions of dollars, was the head of the life science practice at Brobeck years ago, was the general counsel of Valiant, um, was a, a, a partner at Versant Ventures. Um, and so she had a lot of experience on the securities legal side. My chief technology officer for my last company um, was one of the partners, um, and he had a background, obviously, in a lot of the data models and the technology from a software standpoint, because a lot of things we've done have had a data component. And then uh, Felix uh, was the former head of genetics at the FDA, created actually the first regulatory pathway for companion diagnostics there. Um, was a chief scientific officer for Craig Venter's company, Human Longevity. Um, and so he was kind of the PhD scientist on the team. And so we, what we started is we started and said, hey, we're going to invest into, into companies that we think are solving a profound societal problem, hence the name, uh, specifically in healthcare, uh, where we feel that even though we're, we call ourselves minor league investors and the fact that we write small checks, we're major league business builders, you know, having built, you know, fast growing Inc. 500, Deloitte Technology, fast 500 companies. Um, nice small check. Uh, could, could range from 25,000 to 250,000, so very small. Um, but looking for where that money, along with other monies that we can bring together, uh, can make a big impact. Um, and then I recently- uh, time horizon, I imagine, is years. Well, we look for um, opportunities where we can expedite um, the execution. Um, you know, I, I've learned in my life, maybe it's because I'm a bad planner, but the line from point A to point B isn't always straight. <laughs> it's oftentimes a zigzag. And um, building the scaffolding to get from point A to point B um, may not always be the most conventional. For example, let me give you two examples. Um, one of the companies uh, we have an equity position in um, is a brain computer interface company uh, that has a next generation uh, electrode and sensing strip that's actually placed on the surface of the brain. Um, there's also out, outside of the brain, but intracranially, um, it's a next generation sensor, almost doing for what personal, what Intel with their CPUs did for computing power by having a multifactorial silicon chip. Uh, these sensors would allow for kind of that multifactorial uh, deep brain stimulation, neuro stimulation, neuromodulation by sensing, by, by stimulating, and by being able to do it with really, really clear data, um, which obviously opens up big data opportunities and those type of things. And they were originally thinking, okay, this is gonna be a class three, uh, potentially a PMA type situation. Um, because of the complexity of it and that type of thing. But in four conversations with the FDA and some tweaks uh, to the model, uh, we've been able to get the FDA to agree, agree to a 510K class two um, uh, to get the initial clearance uh, for, these, for these sensors. And so what does that do? It turns what have been a multi-year pathway into like an 18 month pathway to the initial commercialization. And then prior to that, got the waiver on the IBE so that we could do it under an IRB to start getting it out there for research purposes to start collecting the data to feed the artificial intelligence and machine learning so you can actually start getting some utilization prior to FDA clearance. So it really comes down to implementation. Um, and that's what I mean by kind of being minor league investors, but major league business builders in the sense that we're not just stroking a check and then sitting back and waiting. Um, we are rolling up our sleeves hopping in and interim management type roles, whatever it is to figure out, okay, how can we make this a rocket ship? How can we grow this business uh, to be able to deliver on the promise to patients, to the providers, to their families, to society at large? 
Um, and so that's Profound Ventures. Um, and I'm really proud of what we've been able to do there. Um, and Part of it in what year? And how much money? So we started at the very end of 2017. So it was kind of like my dealing with post traumatic stress disorder coming out of, <laughs> of the last venture to say, okay, I don't think I can hop in as a CEO and start something new right now um, because of a heartbreak from what I just went through. But let me help others based upon what I've learned. And obviously, you know, some more. Uh, you're a lucky man. Um, I, I sense that, uh, personal note, that you are very mentally healthy and that you're oh. able to. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, well, um, it's but I have a strong faith. Mean, for you to be able to take that kind of heartbreak and to forge on, I mean, it's not even as though you had to redirect. You're like, I know it's right and I'm going to just keep doing it. And yeah, I mean, I, I learned, you know, going back to the, the the story when I was 13 with with the tragedy with Chris, I learned from that experience that one of the most virtuous things that you can do when you go through an awful circumstance, whatever the awful circumstance is, is to either try to, with empathy, help others who are going through a similar circumstance or try to prevent others from having to go through whatever the garbage is that you've gone through. And so um, I, I enjoy uh, I enjoy helping others. I always have. And um and with social impact investing, you know, it's more than just, wow, it's a really good ROI. It's, wow, this is really going to do some good. You know, it's what gets you to spring out of bed in the morning and, and make a positive impact. And that's why I also recently joined Cancer Fund out of Phoenix, um, which is a $30 million micro fund investing in early stage cancer technologies because they want to be social impact as well. And then I also just started last week a podcast uh, called Heart Investors. Um, and that's basically where I, I just want to interview other people that are hard investors and they come from every different walk of life. They could be patients that have been affected by something. We just had uh, a lady on earlier this week, Robin, whose husband uh, was a three-time cancer survivor, has Lynch syndrome and her oldest son, Zach has Lynch syndrome and they created a nonprofit and then she's gotten into the social impact investing side of things. Um, I just think that if we can inspire people to you know, help these companies in medical devices and in diagnostics and in therapies, help them beyond just I donated to a nonprofit, but really help them get to the market so patients can benefit from their technology. We can create an army of innovators um, that can make the world a better place. I, um, I have someone in mind for you. His name is Bill Vick. And back in 2017, I wrote a piece to the group called Bill Vick is Dying. Uh -huh. And uh, he has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, I'll just, I'll share a link to it here in the chat. And uh, folks on the call, as you can see, this conversation can go in lots of different ways. If you want to shape it at all, or you want to uh, interact with Brian, ask him a question, please do so. Um, which of the, actually, no, I, I'm going to take it in a different direction. Uh, from time to time, well, not infrequently, I get asked, Joe, do you know anyone who, fill in the blank, and one of the, the three fill in the blanks are typically um, is hiring, will help me sell my product, or can help me raise money. And while the answer is typically no, for a host of reasons that I will also share in the chat here, uh, an article that I wrote a while ago about why that's so hard for someone who isn't going to invest that kind of time and understanding your, you know, just a random email from someone, I can't do it every time. Um, right. But the hardest among those three to me is, can you help me find someone to give me money? Right. Um, and you've been successful at it repeatedly. Um, I believe that the, the, the primary um, driver of that success is a history of success. Look what he's done before. He's raised money. He's had successful uh, sales, uh, ROIs and such. Um, you can't go wrong with Brian kind of thing. Um, how have you become someone who's able to affect people and get them to open their wallets now on a perhaps smaller level or maybe the donations, uh, the investment fundraising is still significant, only you dole it out in smaller. Portions. Yeah, so no, it's a great question, Joe. You know, and I think that I've definitely come to learn in life that we don't do anything by ourselves. Um, you know, um, it may be a small group of people, um, but generally it's a group of people that really has to make a difference. Um, and 
And so even though we are small investors, we will bring others along with us. Um, and that's either at the time we invest or subsequent to us. I mean, even though we are small investors, um, just within our portfolio of companies in 2020, which was a crazy year, right? Because all the fundraising was done like this. <laughs> um, we helped our portfolio raise over $50 million in subsequent institutional financing um, that's following on after us. Um, and so, you know, in life, when we make good choices, we get more choices. When we make bad choices, we limit our choices. And, um, and that really goes in part with raising capital as well. You want to raise capital in such a way that you have more choices and more opportunities if you need to raise more in the future and not limit yourself. And so just having, again, having been a CEO, having been a founder, having, you know, not slept on Thursday nights wondering if I was going to make payroll, um, having dealt with those challenges. Um, I, um, in our team, um, we just try to, we just try to help. And the reason why we're getting involved is not just for the investment, but it's for the mission. It's the passion. And I think that, you know, I've, uh, there was an adage I heard once that said people buy on emotion and justify on logic. And um, I think investing in, in many ways is the same way when you're approaching an investor, if you're not passionate, or your existing investors aren't passionate about what you're doing, um, it's going to be hard to get them passionate and interested. But when you have investors who are really, really passionate, um, and your team is really passionate around what you're doing, it becomes contagious, and it becomes attractive, and it gives off a positive energy and a vibe that people then want to be a part of. Um, so I, I don't know if I have any secret recipe um, or some brilliant thing. Again, it's a lot of heart. It's a lot of hard work and effort and not giving up. Um, and um, just believing that what we're doing is important. Um, I, I like solving problems. I mean, I, I really, really do. And, um, and, you know, when I was, again, these go back to things I just learned throughout my life, but, you know, going back to that initial example um, with, the, with the bicycle helmet laws, you know, we, we enacted a bunch of bicycle helmet laws in the 1990s while I was in high school. And um, I collaborated with folks at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, and others kind of studying the laws in the different places. And there were some publications that were published on it. Um, in fact, I got an award from the American Academy of Pediatrics on it, which was amazing. Um, I didn't even know what they were at the time. <laughs> but uh, we, we learned that laws, the law in and of itself didn't solve any problems. Um, the government in and of itself really doesn't solve very many problems. Uh, we can look at all the problems over the past 30 years and see the government really hasn't solved any of them. Um, and, and so what made the law work in the jurisdictions where it worked really, really well, and we iterated, was the combination of public education, public health, working with industry, um, working with nonprofits, et cetera, and bringing together stakeholders. So not shareholders, but stakeholders that were involved in the problem and wanted to be a part of building the solution. And that was critical because when we did the bicycle helmet law in that first county, in the county I grew up in, in Howard County, Maryland, it wasn't just, even though I was the head of the, the legislative effort, it was a student multi-dimensional dimensional effort where we were writing curriculum for the schools and holding educational bicycle rallies and a bunch of different things. It was all student led um, to give a legacy to our friend Chris, who had touched the world during his life in a very positive way. And we wanted it to have a legacy afterwards. And what we found, if you looked at the data, because you know I'm a data guy, and look at the, 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 the child mortality rate on bicycles, the 30 years before these laws started going into effect in 1990, and now you look at the 30 years since, and there's been a 93% reduction that happened pretty precipitously in about a four-year period, um, and then it stayed flat, a 92, 93% reduction in childhood uh, bicycle fatalities because of that effort. So over 10,000 kids' lives have been saved. Um, many more head injuries uh, have been avoided. Um, but it wasn't because of a law, and that's important to keep in mind, um, because laws don't solve problems, the government doesn't solve problems. So you got to bring a bunch of stakeholders together, which is really, really important. And so when we invest in a company, we will bring together other stakeholders. So for example, we have uh, two um, raises going on right now. I'm and just showing your, your portfolio on the screen. Yeah, so if you look over here at Mirar, oh, you're in the right. I'm going to go to the team first. Handsome picture. 
It's a really good picture. I know you've been using it for years, but it looks really good. <laughs> yeah, it's because I'm too cheap and I haven't paid for another professional picture to be taken. Really <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us about your, your friends here a little bit. And yeah, so you... Felix is awesome. He's brilliant. He's a PhD. Um, he, uh, again, created that, as I mentioned, the uh, regulatory pathway at the FDA uh, for companion diagnostics. Um, he was a chief scientific officer at Human Longevity. He's actually now an executive in um, one of the pharma companies that we've been involved in that actually has a uh, a new molecular entity that's antiviral that showed great data with COVID. Uh, Laura is the attorney I mentioned beforehand who has incredible experience in securities law. Um, she was our um, chief legal officer uh, in my last company. Um, and uh, she was, let's see, she was a general counsel for Valiant, I'm, I'm sorry, for Obagi and took them through the acquisition with Valiant. Um, and she was the very first a uh, woman partner at Brobeck, I mean, kind of breaking through that glass ceiling years ago and was the head of the life science practice at Brobeck and left them before Brobeck ultimately imploded. Um, but she's uh, just an incredible person as well um, and a dear friend. And then Khan is brilliant. Uh, he was my uh, chief technology officer in my last company. Uh, he has worked with some of the most incredible entrepreneurs in Southern California, he kind of picks and chooses who he works with. Why he chose me, I don't know, but. <laughs> um, I mean, are, are they, they're not full time with you, right? No, no, as, 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 as a fund, um, no one's really full time. Um, and so we just have worked on, you know, different opportunities as they arise. You're going to take us through one of the yeah. Just to give you an example of this idea of, of aligning kind of stakeholders on things, if you look at um, if you scroll up to that Narara one on the top right hand corner there, um, which is that one that I mentioned beforehand that we've been able to get the FDA to recognize as a 510k class two, um, we're in the midst of doing a um, a raise on it right now where we're bringing together neurosurgeons and neurologists. Uh, some people from the medical device industry, as well as um, some stakeholders. Brain as a service. That's interesting. Yeah, it's it's when you think about it, it's really really fascinating what can be done. You know, you have you have um, you know Elon Musk out there talking about his company Neuralink and those type of things. You yeah. have a lot of money that's been invested through uh, the White House Brain Initiative, through DARPA, for example, and the Subnets Initiative, looking at brain computer interfaces. But these guys, on a small amount of money, have been able to do what all these other companies haven't been able to do. And, and that is actually develop a sensor that can go on the outside of the head as well as um, uh, into the brain that provides really, really clear data from a sensing standpoint, and then can also do stimulation. And that's what's pretty powerful about it um, because it allows us to actually see within the brain what's going on. For example, the first indication will be an epilepsy. And many of these, let's say children that start having seizures at a young age, they are put into a situation where they're literally hooked up into the hospital if the medication isn't working for 10 or 14 days where they have these electrodes placed into their brain and you're asking a child to sit still for 10 to 14 days in a hospital. You know, good luck with that for anyone that's been a parent beforehand. Um, and generally, most of the time, more than 50% of the time, after going through that experience, the data is just all noise. You know, it's kind of that signal to noise ratio that exists, let's say, within an EEG. Most of it's all noise. As someone who plays the piano, I know the difference between banging my hands on the keys versus actually knowing how to play. Um, when you look at the data that comes, let's say from a typical EEG or a typical sensor to figure out what's going on in the brain, it, it looks like a really ugly chicken scratch. Um, with this particular technology, it's pristine clear. You can see exactly when the seizures are happening, exactly where it's coming from in the brain. Uh, and Pierre, who founded this company, when he was getting his PhD up at the University of Calgary, a childhood friend of his named Nicole uh, was also at the University of Calgary. And she had one of those episodes in her 20s where she was hooked up to uh, one of these devices for 10 days in the hospital. And of course, what did they say afterwards? They said, oops, sorry, we don't know exactly what's going on. We'll try to make some adjustments to your medication. Um, and she had already had a third of her brain resected when she was much younger. Um, because of these epileptic seizures. And she was having like five seizures a day during this episode. Um, but they couldn't read it exactly. They couldn't tell exactly what was going on because again, the data was garbage. We hear a lot of talk about, you know, big data and artificial intelligence in healthcare. But, you know, let's be real. Uh, net, net at the end of the day, it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, I built some of the largest uh, data sets in healthcare. You know, my last company, we built the world's largest clinical genetic biobank in chronic pain with 153,000 patients with their full genome data, their EMR data, a bunch of clinical outcomes. Um, if EMR data in and of itself 
could solve any problems, then Epic and Cerner would be able to predict things. If health claims data could solve problems, then the ResDAC data out of the University of Minnesota, which comes from Medicare, or Blue Cross Blue Shield Association data would be able to predict a bunch of things. But the problem is, is it's garbage in, garbage out, and most of the data is garbage. Um, I joke all the time when I speak at conferences that I'll say that you know it's no coincidence that health information technology, HIT, are the last three letters of the word SHIT, because most of the data in healthcare is really dirty and it's garbage. Um, and the same thing applies here with brain computer interfaces, with neuromodulation, neurostimulation, EEG data. It's, 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 it's noisy data. And so the ability to make it really pristine and clear opens up the understanding of the clinician, will help improve outcomes, and will allow software technology to make some meaning of it. And we think that this could become a data standard. And so we're already in talks with Medtronic and with Boston Psy and, and Neuropace and others, because these sensors can be used in their devices. Just like the Intel inside, if you will, type chip is used was used in a bunch of different computers when it first came out in 1984. We think there's a there's a huge opportunity there to expand neuromodulation, expand neurostimulation, expand expand deep brain stimulation, expand our understanding of the brain because it's the most important organ and the least understood. And um, and so it, to get from point A to point B from a social impact standpoint, it's more than just the money. It's the execution and it's what type of money we bring to the table. And so we're bringing together people that really care and really understand what is going on now so that they can be part of the solution. Because if you don't engage the people who are part of the problem and sell them on becoming part of the solution, they're going to be friction and they're going to be obstacles to getting to that solution. We see all the time medical devices that get approved by the FDA and they get no market traction. None whatsoever. Um, and it's because you're not building the scaffolding to solve a problem. Solving a problem is more than a technology. It's more than a company. It's more than a bicycle helmet. It's more than a law. It's, it's a movement. It's getting the, all the stakeholders who are involved aligned to get from where you are now to where you want to be. And that's what social impact investing is all about. That's where it comes down to the heart and what you know in the heart and mobilizing and inspiring people to get from where we are now to where we need to be. And that's what we try to do. Um, I'm on my other screen here trying to find uh, the keynote speech from Philip Lowe uh, at a, uh, I think it was 10x 2015. Um, and he's in the, uh, in that same space. In fact, uh, I think his homepage has a video with him working with Elon on something. That's awesome. So I'll see if I can't make that introduction for you. Yeah, there's there's a, lot, a lot of room for improvement there. So you, do you know, do you know him? No, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So we need as many people involved as possible. Um, do you, um, and while you were speaking, I brought up some articles that I've written on uh, epilepsy. Uh, a, a dear friend of mine's daughter died from an epileptic seizure. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I shared those in the uh, in the chat as well. And just to note, while you were speaking, uh, Rick wrote, for your own reference, uh, so you can quote yourself, he was especially impressed when you said, when we make good choices, we get more choices. When we make bad choices, we limit our choices. I don't know if that's a, a mechanism that you use all the time, but it was enough that this audience member thought it was worth pointing out. Oh, well, thanks. I've, I've learned a lot of things through the School of Hard Knocks, so. <laughs> you learned another, experience, one right? the, uh, another one of the uh, adventures that are of particular interest for you right now. Um, let's see. I mean, over there on the top left-hand corner is Monj. That's a really interesting one. Um, and so I, I really believe that innovation happens generally on the fringe of an industry. With the are, playgrounds, okay. Uh, and so um, with Monj, it's a digital health company. Um, there are some devices that are involved, but they're just devices for tracking vitals and those type of things. This company was founded by a world-class chef. When we think about the idea of happy eating, if you will, culturally, for the most part, it's generally associated with unhealthy eating. People drink alcohol, they have sweets, they have high fat or fried foods, whatever it may be. That's usually the food that's involved in a party or a celebration or that type of thing. And so we have this weird connection culturally between happy eating and unhealthy eating. And Adam, who's the founder of this company, is a world-class chef, literally trained under Julia Child, opened up cooking schools all throughout the globe. Um, and then he ended up writing a bunch of books on healthy eating and a happy, healthy life. And net, net at the end of the day, there is a direct connection between healthy eating and a happy life. 
Yet culturally, whether you look at the advertisements on TV or those type of things, you would think that happy life is associated with fairly unhealthy behaviors. Um, and, and so what he has done, he wrote a bunch of books on this, and then he got interested in the technology of it and the behavioral aspects of it. Then he joined an incubator in San Francisco. And uh, during his time when he was even doing management consulting, um, he, uh, he did a bunch of things. He went, first went to work for Kraft Foods and was the head of their innovation group. Um, changed a bunch of their unhealthy ingredients, was trying to change the world from inside craft. Um, he actually invented DiGiorno pizza, uh, self-rising crust, um, and a uh, fascinating guy. But then he realized he wasn't going to change the world inside craft foods when Philip Morris bought them. <laughs> um, and so big That's time. my alma mater as well, by the way. I, my, first, my first major job out of business school was at craft. Really? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so he realized, uh, you know, the people that do, you know, uh, Winston cigarettes and macaroni and craft macaroni and cheese are yeah. probably not going to make the world a healthier place. So he uh, he left them and um, did some consulting for a while, uh, worked in an incubator, and then he created Monge. And Monge, if you think about healthy eating, most people think of really kind of unpleasant things, whether it's you're back to your mom telling you to eat your green vegetables or watching your calories or watching what you eat or not eating what you want or the food not tasting very good. But what he's done is he's mobilized world-class chefs um, to make healthy eating engaging and fun and joyful. Um, and so they've had, um, Ma, he was familiar with another portfolio company that we had, and I had hopped into that company as chief operating officer and fixed a bunch of things last year with them, 10x their revenue, brought in $5 million in investment, you know, I had to unfortunately reduce their workforce by two thirds to get it to cash flowing and that type of thing, but help them fix things. Um, and then Adam was just like, Brian, we need you involved with what we're doing. You know, we've raised this amount of money. We're flat. We need to grow. Um, and so we took an equity position in that company and um, have started to tweak things where, you know, instead of 25,000 a month in revenue, they'll probably do over a million this year in revenue. Um, and, and then we are helping them on uh, and just an A1 round of a couple million dollars and uh, bringing in again, some stakeholders to join with us uh, to get them to, profitability and um, executing on some of the deals that they already have in their pipeline where they can actually implement them. And it's, uh, it's another fascinating play. Again, if people can eat well um, and have good eating habits and a good relationship with food, there are a lot of chronic conditions uh, that will subside and will be able to reduce a lot of cost in the healthcare system and hopefully extend people's lives and their quality of their lives. So find that really interesting. You know, people have mobilized dietitians, they've mobilized health coaches, they've mobilized physical trainers, those type of things, but chefs probably make eating the most fun. And so why not engage chefs? I mean, he's got like, you know, champions from Food Network's Chopped TV show on, I mean, a bunch of different things to really inspire people with diabetes, with renal disease, with uh, uh, heart failure, various different things to really change their behavior with regards to food and eat healthy and become healthier. And the outcomes look great. I mean, sustainable weight loss over two years uh, and those type of things. So really, really good stuff. I mean, I want to uh, in the absence of questions, or actually, I, I have a question for the audience. If there's if there's a um, a social impact medical device cause that you'd like to bring to Brian's attention, this would be a good uh, way to do that. Um, I'm going to ask a different question. the The first company that we looked at, um, I got it right away, and I look at this one, and I'm as a marketing strategist. I have no idea what <laughs> yeah. they're trying to do here it's, it's one of, it's one of the things, in this yeah. context, because, you know, you said you invest I with totally agree, Jim. Totally agree. And, well, and we've, mean, had to, we've had to tweak the, their pitch big time. Forget about that. But I mean, I, I'm just, I'm so lost that I have to um, challenge you. Uh, and I know you'll easily knock this question out of the park, but defend yourself. You gave money to them. I don't know what the money was uh -huh. going toward, but. If I don't, I certainly don't understand their value proposition because if it's just download my app and in the absence of knowing anything better, I'm going to have to help you eat healthier. Talk about a flooded marketplace. How will they ever generate any real revenue and make it sustainable? And I'm like, how much did you give them? So great question. 
So yeah, so the website sucks. I agree. Um, and, and that's going to have to change. I know a guy, by the way. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so it, what we have done, originally their model was kind of, they had a direct consumer component to it and that type of thing. And that's a, an incredibly crowded space. And, and Noom is, is kind of the, the big leader there. So what we've done is we've created an integrated care model um, that basically they work with like ACOs, they work with payers, um, and they distribute a program that involves a mobile app but also involves a series of coaching sessions, uh, cooking classes, a host of different things where there's outcomes that are measured, um, there's a device in the home, um, et cetera. And as they go through this program, it's reimbursable under medical nutrition therapy and some other things based upon medical necessity criteria in certain situations. There's a, an IBT potential reimbursement on it on intensive behavioral therapy change. Uh, so there's different, there's different coding rubrics depending on the program um, from a third party reimbursement standpoint, but it works in conjunction with the physicians in prescribing the program and implementing it in an integrated care model. So there's a fee for service component as well as an advanced payment method type approach to it. Um, so it's a program is what it is. It involves the app, the device, and all of the therapy sessions. So I've invited uh, my pediatrician friend and my reimbursement friend oh, Nick. slash challenge. I have to be amused, Nick, that in the short while since you, you know, were off camera, you made sure to put your little thing back on, lest it's flying in on you again. So thank you for revealing yourself once more. We appreciate that. Uh, Laura, you had your hand up. Well, I was going to say, first of all, if you remind me when I speak in July, whenever it is, um, I will give you a very clear picture of how what Brian just said fits into the healthcare system and what the return might be. Brian, I love what you had to say. I, I, it's a good thing that I was muted off the unable to chat and stuff. But uh, as a pediatrician who worked many years in injury prevention, including with the National Safe Kids, spokesperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics, and doing all sorts of things outside of the traditional healthcare system, including very much a social entrepreneur without the money to do the financial impact, but guiding a lot of those companies. Um, the quick answer, Joe, just to get people thinking about it is um, what I'm gonna talk about, I think when we talk later is the health 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 model, acute illness, chronic disease, wellness and prevention. We are deep in wellness and prevention, which brings us really far outside the four traditional walls of the healthcare system. And the stat that's going around where 80% of health outcomes are determined by non-traditional healthcare related things, socioeconomics, environmental, behavioral, puts things like certainly sleep um, and exercise, but certainly nutrition right there. And in the nutrition world, the challenge, because I deal in all these other skills and behavior change and things like that, is I wrote a book called Food Fights about winning the nutritional challenges of parenthood. It's not all about the food, right? I mean, like you've got all sorts of things that determine behavioral intervention, but potentially with a significantly larger impact than any drug or medical treatment. So there's my quick answer to support Brian and what I thought was a really interesting presentation. I'm also about to jump into a potentially very large neuroscience related thing. So we may have to talk yeah, at some point. Talk, definitely. This is for Nicholas. What were your thoughts? I mean, if if this were approach, so Nick used to be the guy who made decisions over at Intermountain Health. Joe, um, you'll, you'll never believe it, but Brian and I are friends now because of you. Oh, we are. I do believe that. In fact, <laughs> I thought I had introduced you, but I couldn't remember. Yeah. So Brian came to Salt Lake and we had dinner here. And I've since been to Brian's beautiful house in California for a meeting on a separate project. It's working, but, ladies and gentlemen, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Joe's group is a great group. Yeah. Ben, Cott, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and oh, what time is it over there? Yeah, it's about uh, it's about nine thirty in the evening. Yes. Yeah. Well, we we hope to get Ben Cott out in uh, in May. He's already looking into it. But uh, you had a question about neural devices. Yes, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I work in a test lab basically specifically an EMC and a safety test lab. And uh, we test a lot of devices. And uh, the problem globally, I think, is that in neural devices, there is a series of uh, standards for active implantables, uh, which is ISO 14117, if I'm not wrong. It's a series of standards. And uh, there are very few test labs across the world, maybe one or two in US and a couple in Europe, which are accredited for these standards. And the reason is, uh, there are very few, it's a, such a small niche market that it is very uneconomical for the lab to invest in uh, a very particular kind of uh, facility and uh, rather, you know, uh, the, the time of the lab can be spent in a better way, earning more revenue elsewhere. So 
are you planning or how do you plan to solve that or are there any suggestions for that because i believe that uh, there are a lot of startups working uh, startups and companies working in this area but due to the lack of testing facilities a lot of projects they don't uh, culminate in the final product yeah no it's, it's it's a great question there are if we look at the what's the best way to say it? the ecosystem maybe that allows for these technologies uh, to come to market, there are huge gaps and Bank have just you know, pointed to one. We, this particular company works with the Alfred Mann Foundation uh, in mm -hmm. LA, which is able to do uh, that work, but you're right. Whether it's that, whether, I mean, honestly, the biggest issue right now that no one's really talking about, but, um, but it's one of those things that is huge is the, the, the fires that have happened in those factories for silicon chips in Japan. Um, you'd be surprised how much it's affecting things. Like I was just at my dealership getting some tires replaced on my car and they were telling me they're only getting seven new cars in in the entire month of July because of the limits on the chips. Um, and so when you bring up a really good point that there is there is an issue of the supply chain and the different stages of development and where those capabilities are. And because it's a fairly nascent market, most of these technologies in the, in the neural space have been last resort type technologies. Um, mm -hmm. There hasn't been the same need. My hope, it's a hope, um, but I believe the forecast will show it to be true is we're gonna see a massive expansion in neuromodulation, mm -hmm. neurostimulation, deep brain stimulation, brain computer interfaces, and those type of things over the next 10 years. And that mm -hmm. demand or supply, depending on how you look at it, will probably necessitate labs like the one you're you're affiliated with to expand their capabilities because there's going to be more customers willing to pay. So just I like to share one point is we are going in for A2LA accreditation in next uh, month for this uh, series of active implantable devices. And uh, what I understand is uh, like even the test labs have to, you know, they also have to apply for accreditation and they try again and two, three times and then they succeed in that. So it's it's like we also don't have all the data because we have the engineering data, but we don't have the medical data. So there are a lot of uh, places where we are trying to do that. So we already have accreditation for all the non-implantables, but we, we want to get into that. Well, that's great. Yeah, if you would email me, I'll put my email um, in there. Send me the capabilities because I'm also... I've been the entrepreneur in residence for the Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics and the Brain Mapping Foundation the past couple of years and helping a lot of these researchers across the globe um, get their technologies either into larger companies or to help them start companies, just having built fast growing companies in this space. Um, the chairman of, and founder of that group asked me to help out. And so I may be able to connect some people to you guys to, uh, to help both sides. Thank you. All right, just uh, make sure that everyone has access to Brian's uh, email address in the chat. And um, Laura, you went and wrote out something. Why don't you just uh, share that with the group? Oh, yeah, I just forgot to mention um, that there's also a group. I don't know if you know the Eat Forum people in, in stock based out of Stockholm, very much social impact minded with all sorts of things you know, around food and nutrition. Um, the woman who started it, very like force of nature, powerful, medically trained, but she looks like she could be a Vogue model um, and married the power billionaire couple in Scandinavia. So she started the EAT Forum, lots of stuff tied in with the United Nations and the Food Summit and all. But one of the things that they did was recognize very early on to bring in the chefs. So their, their food forum, you go there and you eat the best food you've ever eaten and it's all you know sustainable. And they came out with the Lancet report. And this is where Joe, it's interesting to start seeing where they partner up with the Lancet and 39 or so global experts came out with a report a few years ago, it's on their website. Um, that was basically good for you, good for the planet had chefs create the men, like globally renowned chefs create the menus. And it might be also a good place, Brian, to spotlight um, your company because they spotlight oh, yeah. some of the small companies that that captured, they would they reward people for in treating packaging. They do a lot of the, um, on the tech side, you know, whether it's like minute level sensors or ways to determine food content, calories, nutrition value from imaging or something. So some really cool stuff in that space. You might be very interested. Awesome, thanks. Sure. That's why we do this. And uh, hopefully you guys will meet in person in May. Absolutely. And for anyone that you know is involved in social impact investing or has worked with social impact investors as part of their ventures or those type of things, and you want to tell your story, um, you know, 
I think these webinars and podcasts are amazing. That's why we started the Hard Investors one. We'd love to have you on to educate and inspire others because just like Joe does such a great job with his amazing contacts and Rolodex of bringing people together and creating that pollination, we're trying to inspire people to be hard investors, which they could just be someone themselves. I mean, gosh, in Cancer Fund, they've set up a vehicle where people can literally invest as little as $500 um, and invest into Cancer Fund and be investing alongside these big VCs and those type of things. So, it, you know, it's... It can be small, it can be big, um, you know, small meetings, just like Joe that has huge meetings and he facilitates one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's it's just taking little steps or even big steps to make a difference. Networking matters a lot. Yep. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that you're in line. So thank you, Brian, for joining us today. Uh, you, next week is, uh, our, our Friday falls on July 2. So I expect a little bit of a lighter audience and uh, who wants to speak to a lighter audience. So. I'm taking the week um, and uh, I'm making the hour available to all of you, any of you who have a marketing question. I don't plan on preparing much, um, but we can look at your site together. We could talk about anything under the sun that has to do with marketing strategy. How would you do this? How would you do that? And uh, we'll make it a completely interactive session. So that's what's up for next week. Brian, you're welcome to join us any week that you're hanging out at 8 a.m. in the morning and uh, Thanks again. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Stay cool. Bye.